It will doubtless be the opinion of many a reader that a prefatory essay on such a subject as punning can possess little of interest and nothing of novelty. I would, however, request anyone entertaining this idea to suspend his judgment till he has given the matter ampler consideration. Still, it has been too much the case to treat it with levity and inconsiderateness, to regard it as mere trifling, to view it at best as a feeble missile from the armory of wit, and which those who are qualified to wield more valuable weapons would scarcely deign to employ. I trust that in the course of these introductory observations I shall effectually dispel all such erroneous prejudices, and shall satisfactorily assert the true dignity of the art, so that my readers may join with me in exclaiming, Puns are good, actually. Hi. Is this- can you, like, take me seriously at all? Hi, I'm Zoe B. And today, I want to talk to you about a dangerous substance terrorizing our streets. This? This is a really cute bottle, isn't it? Well, what I'm here to talk to you about isn't cute. But it is small. Small enough, you can't even see it. There is an invisible enemy that walks among us, sneaks into our conversations, makes its way into books, articles, tweets, even video essays. It warps our minds, leaves us vulnerable, and lowers our standards for comedy. This scourge on our community is, of course, puns. Let me lay down the law upon the subject. A pun is prima facie an insult to the person you're talking with. It implies utter indifference to or sublime contempt for his remarks, no matter how serious. To trifle with vocabulary, which is the vehicle of social intercourse, is to tamper with the currency of human intelligence. In other words, puns are dangerous. When people play with language, the most important tool we have, the thing that allows us to communicate with one another, then they're willing to do just about anything. Nothing is sacred to them. To explain what exactly puns do that makes them so dangerous, I'd like to tell you the story of Mr. Pun. Mr. Pun was a bitter old man. He was so bitter because while all his neighbors were funny, fun-loving people, Mr. Pun was cursed with the inability to tell a joke. This curse brought a lot of pain into Mr. Pun's life, and eventually he was consumed by it, and saw no outlet except to force that pain upon the lives of everyone else around him. Mr. Pun made it his life's work to root out all the fun, beautiful humor in the world and corrupt it. He made a mockery of jokes. Whenever he heard someone about to tell a joke, he would rudely jump into the conversation and shout out some nonsense sentence about some unrelated homophone, totally derailing the entire conversation, all because he simply wasn't born with the finesse, timing, and ability to read people that one requires to be a comedian. He started by preying on children. He would go up to their homes, knock twice, and if a child answered the door, he would begin indoctrinating them into his school of comedy. Their simple, innocent minds were no match for the silly gibberish that made up Mr. Pun's attempts at humor. This, of course, was where the modern scourge known as knock-knock jokes was born. Where jokes brought people together, Mr. Pun drove them apart. His corruption of humor, called puns even caused people pain. And that's why, even today, the most common reaction to a pun is a groan. But if puns are so dangerous, then why is this video in support of them? I mean, it is called Puns Are Good Actually, and I did open with that whole quote about how, you know, you really should uh, give puns a chance. And obviously, this whole sketch is like a joke, but there really is a real fraught history of puns that goes back literally thousands of years. And puns really are considered the lowest form of humor. 
but it but I also just kind of love puns, you know, in spite of all the bad press. All this fear-mongering about puns is misguided, and we need to redirect our perspectives and chart a course toward appreciating this wildly underappreciated form of wordplay. And since, as we all know, I am very funny, definitely very good at telling jokes, I will be your captain on this cruise across the vast pun -cific ocean. And since uh, I'm actually very quickly <laughs> running out of boat, words. Uh, let's hoist the anchor and raise the sails and set our sights for the unexplored wilds of wordplay. Without further ado, let's go. <sighs> that one was good. I liked that one. Let critics say what they will. I will venture to affirm that punning, of all arts and sciences, is the most extraordinary. For all others are circumscribed by certain bounds, but this alone is found to have no limits, because to excel therein requires a more extensive knowledge of all things. Now the first question to ask is what even is a pun? Because it turns out there are a lot of different definitions of puns, and even experts can't really agree on a single meaning. Even when I polled my followers on Twitter, go follow me on Twitter at Zoe underscore the B, there were a ton of different positions. Some people think puns are when two words that sound the same are used interchangeably, while others think it's when you replace one word with another that sounds sort of similar, and some people think that pun encompasses all wordplay. I fall in the last camp, as do a lot of pun researchers. To us, a pun happens pretty much any time there is an expectation of one sound or meaning, and then a different sound or meaning is used in its place, usually in a way that relates to the content or context of the statement. It's basically a linguistic bait-and-switch. And because this definition is so broad, pun scholars have to organize puns into different categories just to keep everything straight. I won't go into every single category in excruciating detail, but I will give a brief overview of the main ones so that we're all on the same page about what I mean when I say pun. So, the most common type are homographic puns, which occur when there's a word with multiple meanings and both meanings could apply. Like if I said that mathematicians make good pilots because they spend a lot of time with planes. <laughs> Then there's the second most common type, which are homophonic puns, and these show up whenever you use two similar sounding words with different meanings, like camping is really hardcore, you know, it's intense. These can be further broken down into paradigmatic puns, which require some outside knowledge to understand, like the mathematician pilot joke, which required that you know that plane can refer to aircraft or to flat, infinite, two-dimensional geometric surfaces, and syntagmatic puns, which give the reader sufficient context to understand the pun on its own. Like if I said, the wedding was so beautiful, the bride was in tears, and the cake was in tears too. It reveals itself to be a pun. Now, there's also a lot of different kinds of wordplay that are connected to puns. First, we have spoonerisms, meld puns, and portmanteaus, which all occur whenever parts of words are smashed into other parts of words to create new Frankenstein's monster words like brunch, staycation, or the Shel Silverstein book Runny Babbitt. There's also story puns, which are some of my favorites, and they're either like drawn out puns or they take idioms or well known phrases and flip them around like this scene from Deadpool. What's a nice place like you doing in a girl like this? There's also Wellerisms and Tom Swifties, which are puns that show up in prepositional phrases and dialogue tags, like I see, said the blind man as he picked up his hammer and saw, and my shirt needs pressing, the bare-chested man observed ironically. And last but not least, we have knock-knock jokes. Yes, 
Even knock-knock jokes are related to puns. Aren't you glad we're done with this section? <sighs> now that we've finished defining puns, we can start defending them. And the first step in proving that puns are good is to talk about why people think they're bad in the first place. The idea that puns are bad is relatively recent in the grand scheme of the history of human language, and this wave of anti-pun sentiment, at least in the West, actually popped up during the Age of Enlightenment. Pre-Enlightenment, a time also known as the English Renaissance, was a heyday for puns. And puns in this era weren't just for humor. They were seen by many as similar to metaphor or poetry. They were rhetorical devices that speakers could use to say two things at once and the ability to seamlessly weave puns into your prose was revered and respected. This golden age of puns was also the time that Shakespeare was writing in, and he and other writers like him really had their fingers on the pulse of the culture of the British Empire. All sorts of classes and genders and dialects were mixing together and rubbing off on one another, and that led to an explosion of culture, and the English language blossomed into a really weird and kind of messy but beautiful flower, like a... a linguisteria, if you will, that was then hacked off, pulped, and juiced before having a label slapped onto it and being peddled by unhappy 30-somethings in department stores that smell like $200 handbags that spell... <laughs> smell like $200 handbags and sell overpriced perfume in a desperate attempt to stay in business. You know, capitalism. The 17th and 18th centuries were known as the Age of Enlightenment, and it was a time of discovery, both geographic and scientific, and many of the philosophical and political treatises written by great Enlightenment thinkers are still used as the basis of science, philosophy, and politics in many Western nations. But along with this focus on industry, science, rationality, and prosperity came some less than desirable side effects. See, mercantilism was on the rise as the British Empire sought to expand foreign trade and their global influence, and with this sort of proto-capitalism came a widening divide between rich and poor. One way that the new wealthy class distinguished themselves was through etiquette, or the social rules of politeness. Enlightenment thinkers valued rationality over emotions, reason over feeling, and in practice, this meant controlling your impulses, or acting, or at least appearing, as refined and restrained as possible. Compared to the bold and bawdy, rowdy and randy sensibilities of Shakespeare's day, these new Enlightenment folks were pretty much just a bunch of pretentious pricks. And even worse, they were a bunch of painfully unfunny pretentious pricks. Where Shakespeare thrived on puns and double entendre and sex jokes, 18th century gentlemen preferred more highbrow, civilized entertainment. Frequent and loud laughter is the characteristic of folly and ill manners. It is the manner in which the mob express their silly joy at silly things, and they call it being merry. In my mind, there is nothing so illiberal and so ill-bred as audible laughter. What this meant for puns, though, is that they were dismissed as being childish and silly. They were the jokes of the unintelligent underclass. After all, anyone could pun from the most revered playwrights to the illiterate dock workers. And if anyone could pun, then how valuable could it really be, right? To make matters worse, when the first English language dictionary was published in 1775, the spelling, pronunciation, and meanings of words became more standardized, which clashed with the innate fluidic with the innate linguistic fluidity of puns. I'm going to read you that paragraph. Language was being stratified and codified. There were now rigid rules for what words meant and how they should be written and spoken, and there were even more unspoken social rules for what you could say in certain situations or with certain company. All of this cultural, economic, and linguistic change meant that puns were condemned to live out their days in children's joke books and working-class households, and any respect they got was given by academic outcasts, outspoken if inflammatory thinkers and writers who still believed in the power of puns, despite the scorn of their contemporaries. So, because of the Enlightenment, 
puns lost all the rhetorical prestige they had built up over literally thousands of years, and the pretentious positions of the pompous pricks in power became standard practice, and the rest, as they say, is history. But Zoe! <laughs> That's awful. But Zoe! No. <laughs> I've lost it. I've lost the butt Zoe now. Um, but Zoe! I hear you say. Just because capitalism and enlightenment values, including a disdain for puns, have stuck around, that doesn't necessarily mean there's no other good reason to dislike puns. I mean, puns are bad. They're just not funny. There's no arguing with that. Well, hypothetical viewer, let's explore that a little bit more. So, without getting into all of the different theories of humor, because that's a topic for a future video, I want to give a brief overview of what makes things funny. The prevailing theory is incongruity theory, which roughly means that things are funny because they subvert expectations or are incongruous with reality. You expect one situation, get a different situation, and that realization and reconciliation is what produces the feeling of amusement. Puns very obviously fit this mold. When you hear a pun in its most basic form, like the architect wasn't able to break out of prison because the walls weren't built to scale, your brain processes one possible meaning of the punned upon word, to scale meaning to climb, and then when you realize there's a pun, you're forced to recognize the other meaning of the word, scale as in size and proportion, and that disconnect to reconnect process is precisely what incongruity theory is about. But this doesn't mean that every pun is funny just because it sets up a situation and then subverts it. In fact, a lot of puns fail. But a lot of jokes fail too, and for a lot of the same reasons. Humor falls flat when it fails to be incongruous, when it doesn't subvert expectations. This happens a lot with puns because the easiest puns to make are the most obvious ones to spot. But this isn't exclusive to puns. Jokes fall prey to the exact same issue. Ever wonder why a lot of older comedy isn't funny anymore? And no, the answer isn't because cancel culture and political correctness. Those jokes aren't funny because we've heard them a hundred times before. You know how boring it is to hear, father, I can't click the book, or ha, huh, women can't drive, for the thousandth time? Those jokes aren't funny because they don't subvert any expectations. I mean, you know, they're also just kind of shitty, but the main point is that they aren't doing anything new or interesting. Puns can also fail when they aren't tied to context. Like, if I were to just, out of the blue, pull out a jar of spices and say, fuck, tied to context. Like, if I were to just, out of the blue, pull out a jar of spices and say, wow, I've really got a lot of time on my hands. That's not funny, because it's just like, yeah, those two words sound the same, but that has nothing to do with our conversation. Uh, ooh, ooh, I'm gonna have time in my carpet for Oh no. Man. I'm really in a pickle. This was, a, this was a poor choice. I'm a professional. I get paid for this. Now I have to finish this pickle because I can't just put it back in the jar. God damn it. Okay. I have a little bit of vinegar on my couch. I'm making a mess. That vinegar is bright. Um, actually, I'm gonna have this on my lap just a little bit. It's gonna just appear. Okay, let's start over. It smells really good. In other words, yeah, puns may not always be hilarious, but neither are jokes. It's just that no one uses the existence of bad jokes as evidence that the entire concept of jokes are bad and unfunny and their existence should be purged from the entire language. 
In reality, puns and jokes can hardly even be compared. So stop saying that puns aren't funny when your standard for humor is jokes. Puns and jokes aren't the same thing. Saying puns aren't funny jokes is like saying pies aren't good soups. Like, yeah, that's because they're two different things. But sometimes they share ingredients, and sometimes they share flavors, and sometimes they can even be eaten together. But they do different things and have different purposes and are just fundamentally different. Just like the best apple pie is still a shitty clam chowder, so too is the greatest pun not necessarily the funniest joke. But Zoe! I hear you shout yet again. Just because people's reasons for believing puns are bad are themselves bad, that doesn't necessarily mean that puns are good. And yes, dear listener, you are right. There's a huge difference between not bad and actually good. So let's talk about why puns are actually good. Now, this might be a cop-out answer, but the first reason that puns are good, actually, is because they're just, like, fun. And when they're used in writing, they make that text fun, too. There isn't really a science to this. I mean, we'll get to the science if you want science. I have plenty of science, trust me. But puns are just fun. For thousands of years, writers have been incorporating puns and other wordplay into their writing because it adds charm and flavor to the text. It's well known that Shakespeare liked his double entendre, but he was far from the first or last writer to use puns in their work. Others, like Jonathan Swift and Oscar Wilde, both Irish and both incredibly witty, built their careers off of puns. I mean, Wilde wrote a whole play off the idea that Ernest can be a name and an adjective. Puns are especially prevalent in children's literature, like Alice in Wonderland and The Phantom Tollbooth, where the main character goes on a magical adventure with Talk the Watchdog, like literally a watchdog, where they meet a spelling bee, and part of the kingdom is ruled by a mathemagician. Seriously, The Phantom Tollbooth is like the most underrated kids book. I could honestly do an entire video on how incredible it is. I love it so much. Puns make writing pop. You know what else they make pop? Music. Like, mu pop. A ton of popular music is built on puns. The example that always pops into my head is Eminem's Now You Get to Watch Her Leave Out the Window, guess that's why they call it window pane. But there's also Jay-Z's Brooklyn, where he says, I Brooklyn Dodger them, I Jack, I Rob, I Sin, aw oh man, I'm Jackie Robinson, which is like four puns in one, and it's absolutely incredible. Colors by the Black Pumas isn't just about the beauty of sunsets and the changing leaves, but also the beauty of human diversity. The blues in Johnny Cash's Folsom Prison Blues refers to the style of music, the sadness and frustration that come from incarceration, and the color of the inmates' uniforms. And there's also a song about a double date gone wrong called You Can't Have Your Kate and Edith Too. Oh, uh, and also The Beatles. The Beatles is a pun. Like, literally one of the most famous and most popular and most influential bands in the history of the world have a pun for a name. I can't make this shit up. Everyone puns. Your favorite writers and musicians pun all the time, and you probably enjoy it, even if you think you don't like puns. All of these incredible artists didn't think that puns were too low for them to use in their art. And we, all of us who appreciate their work, are better off for it. Puns add fun, puns add fun and flavor and heart to books and music and art. They make writing fun. We should value the pun. Or stop hating it, just for a start. I feel like that's cheesy. Oh well. But Zoe, what do puns actually do? Like, yeah, they're in all these books and plays and songs, but why is that good? That's a great question, hypothetical viewer. You know I can't actually, like, hear what you're saying. What? But first, uh, before we can jump into actually talking about puns, we first need to dive into some cognitive linguistics and talk a little bit about how our brains process language. 
So as I've talked a little bit about before on this channel, we have lazy brains. Our brains really like taking the path of least resistance at every possible opportunity, and language processing is no different. When we process language, we fill in gaps and make a ton of assumptions and predictions. Think of your brain like Google. When you Google something, even if none of your words are spelled right and your search looks like total nonsense, Google still knows exactly what you are trying to say. Most of the time. Our brains do this too. I'm sure you've seen those viral pictures where there's a sentence where every word has its letters rearranged, but yet we're still able to read it, if we're fluent speakers of the language at least. That is your brain making assumptions and filling in gaps, using what it knows about the subconscious rules of language. Your brain knows what common words and phrases are, and it knows where words usually appear in sentences, and it does all of these probability calculations in a fraction of a second, and suddenly what was once gibberish is now actually readable. Your brain does a similar thing when you hear people speaking. You know the whole Laurel Yanny thing that went viral a couple years ago? Laurel. 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 This phenomenon, where two people can hear two wildly different things, is just what happens when your brain tries to make sense of ambiguous stuff. Are you done? Your brain also does its own version of Google's autocomplete. When you start typing in the search bar, Google starts auto-completing your search string based on statistics and other common searches. When you hear someone speak, your brain does the exact same thing. You know what common words and phrases are, and so if your brain can fill in a conversation with those common words and phrases that you have stored in your mental storeroom, then it doesn't have to waste energy on actually listening to and processing every single word you hear. But this is where puns come and throw a wrench into things. Because when there's a pun, when we sense that a sentence has some kind of double meaning, we have to do a double take. Because when there's a pun, we cannot rely on the most common meaning of a word, because the most common meaning isn't the only meaning being used in a sentence. To quote noted pun scholar John Pollock, Upon hearing an ambiguous word, the brain must work backward to make its best educated guess about the speaker's intent, including the possibility that this intent is to convey multiple meanings. But the human brain can't necessarily rely on the frequency of a word's most common use to make its best estimate. Instead, it has to qualitatively judge all available evidence to resolve the apparent incongruity. It's the brain's ability to quickly recognize the incongruous interpretations and catch the unexpected secondary meanings that imbues them with humor. And this is what allows puns to actually help exercise our brains and stretch our language processing muscles. Because usually when we're confronted with ambiguity, if someone mispronounces a word, or if there's a typo, or if we simply mishear something, we know that there's only one right answer. And once we've figured out what the word was supposed to be, we can move on. But not so with puns, because with puns, both meanings of a word are important. To quote Pollock again, puns require the brain to maintain multiple meanings of a word simultaneously. Rather than simply suppressing the competition or choosing an outright winner, as it often does when confronted with ambiguity. In other words, puns are good for our brains because they force us to consider not just one meaning of a word, but all meanings of words, and to hold all those meanings in our brain at once and carefully consider each one, testing not just our vocabulary, but our understanding of double entendre, subtlety, and idioms. In this way, puns are like riddles or lateral thinking puzzles. When we're solving puns, we have to think about things differently than we normally do. We have to think outside of our normal linguistic box. We have to find connections between otherwise unconnected words and ideas, make creative and abstract associations. And it turns out that's actually really good for our brains. Punning stretches our cognitive muscles and makes us better word people. Uh, word users? Worders? Worders. It makes us better worders. It turns out that this mental exercise is actually part of what has allowed humans to do all of the cool, creative, innovative stuff that we've been doing for thousands of years. 
As John Pollock says, the remarkable human capacity for creative abstract association is the same ability that enabled someone to see a rolling log and conceptualize a wheel. Punning is about freeing our imagination to leap from one idea to the next to the next, even when those leaps seem illogical or impossible. And it is precisely that capacity to link wildly disparate ideas that enabled people through thousands of generations of trial and error to move from cave to skyscraper to space station and from drum to telegraph to iPhone. The pun is a way to identify and articulate potential connections that aren't necessarily or immediately apparent. And it is this same urge to imagine, explore, and establish new connections that fuels creativity generally and science specifically. The same cognitive muscles that we stretch to make puns are also used to do science and create inventions and come up with new and innovative solutions to really big problems. If, according to the Encyclopedia of Creativity, humor and creativity share similar cognitive, behavioral, and emotional processes that give the two parallel psychological implications, then puns are a really important part of how our brains work. So, to answer the question from earlier, why are puns actually good? Puns are good because they help us stretch our language processing and problem-solving muscles, and they actually represent just how amazing our brains are. To quote the ever-eloquent Zoe B, puns make us better worders. Worders. Word-ers. Okay. I'm kind of hoping that Charlie will come sit on my lap at some point. Would you like to do that? Would you like to do that? Maybe. Okay. Puns don't just help with this abstract, internal, individual stuff, though. They actually play a really important part in culture as well. One of the things that puns are particularly useful for is subversive language. If you want to make a point about an off-limits topic, or if you want to insult someone but you want to have plausible deniability, then puns are the tool for you. Writers and artists throughout history have used puns and other related wordplay to get around censors and breach taboo subjects. Shakespeare did it all the time to subvert the censorship imposed by England's Master of the Revels, the guy whose whole job was to decide what was acceptable for the sensitive and innocent eyes of the public to see. Apparently, sexy stuff was a little too risque for 16th century audiences, because in order to keep his plays within the legal limit, Shakespeare had to hide his dick jokes in the comforting folds of crafty wordplay. I kind of hate myself for writing that. <sighs> if you want to read more about that, I recommend A Dictionary of Shakespeare's Sexual Puns and Their Significance, written by Frank and Rubenstein, who must have the world's coolest job. Anyway. These puns by necessity didn't disappear over the 400 or so years since Shakespeare's time, and while the position of master of the revels stopped being a thing in the late 1700s, there are still people who are employed to decide what kind of language is or is not allowed to be used in art. Today, these people are known here in the US at least as the Federal Communications Commission, or FCC, and while the Communications Act of 1934 prohibits the FCC from censoring broadcasts, there are still a fair amount of rules on what's allowed to be broadcast and when. The Communications Act protects indecent and profane materials, that is, material that shows sex organs or includes language that's considered a public nuisance, though that kind of material is still only allowed to be shown late at night in order to minimize the risk of children watching. Because won't someone think of the children? <coughs> this all sounds well and good, right? But the FCC is allowed to censor obscene material since it apparently isn't covered by the First Amendment. According to the FCC website, obscene material is material that meets a three-pronged test established by the Supreme Court. Obscene material must appeal to an average person's prurient interest, where prurient means sexual, basically. It depicts or describes sexual conduct in a patently offensive way, and, taken as a whole, it lacks serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. Basically, obscene material gets bonked and sent to horny jail.
even the relatively mild, indecent, and profane material has limits. If a TV show, for instance, includes this kind of material, then they have two choices. Either it can only be shown between the hours of 10 p.m. and 6 a.m., or if they want to show it during prime hours, they have to self-censor their material. Now, most shows choose the latter because execs don't want to miss out on those sweet, sweet advertising dollars. But that doesn't necessarily mean that those shows go quietly. Many TV show writers try to push boundaries and test the limits of what's allowed to be shown, and they often poke fun at the seemingly arbitrary rules of the FCC. And one of the best ways to do this is through, you guessed it, puns. Because puns are inherently duplicitous, that is, they say two things at once, they are the perfect tool for people trying to say something on the down low while on the surface looking innocent. One show that does this particularly well is Arrested Development, which is chock full of all kinds of puns. There's the Lucille running gag. Watch out for Lucille! The potentially taboo relationship between George Michael and his cousin, Maybe. And that's when George Michael finally got close to Maybe, who, by the way, might not be his biological cousin. And also, literally, the name of the show. Like, it's called Arrested Development, which is a psychology term that could refer to really any of the main characters, but it's also about a family who do crimes related to housing developments, and also the first episode literally opens with an arrest. So the main development that incites the rest of the show is someone getting arrested. Anyway, the puns in Arrested Development aren't just these fun, silly, harmless ones. They also use puns to poke fun at the seemingly arbitrary rules for what is and is not considered profane language. For instance, in one episode in season three, the show highlights how some words that seem offensive in some contexts aren't offensive in other contexts. And I'm afraid to say the word because in American English, the word is offensive and the almighty algorithm might not be happy with it, but I'm sure my wonderful editor is flashing it on the screen right now. Oh, Michael. You're such a Michael was stunned. Rita meant it in the British sense, meaning sweet or gentle, as in pussy cat. The Jerry's aren't so bad. They're just being led by a rotten apple. Oh, Reggie, fighting for your country. You're such a pussy. Before this show, censorship regulation was sort of stuck and it couldn't change. Like, they were you know, fixed in one position, like, restrained in their growth. You know, Arrested Development. Hey, that's the name of the show. Arrested Development and TV content guidelines are just the tip of the proverbial punberg, though, because wordplay has also been used by groups around the world to protest even stronger and more dangerous kinds of censorship. In Nazi Germany, there were whisper jokes or flusterbits. These whisper jokes were little puns and other wordplay that people would make criticizing Hitler and other leaders. For instance, as one joke goes, an art collector had acquired some portraits of Adolf Hitler, Hermann Goring, and Joseph Goebbels. She wasn't sure how to display them, so she went up to her friend and asked, well, what do you think? Should we hang them or put them up against the wall? <laughs> Pause for laughter, I guess. <laughs> During the Cold War, people made similar jokes about the paranoia-induced breaches of civil liberties in nations like the US and the UK. When the government placed signs in the London Underground telling citizens to be alert, angsty British youths decided to take the concept and run with it, graffitiing responses like, no, this country has enough alerts, be aloof instead. And American poet Louis Untermeyer had a famous love for puns, and when he once quipped that he thought Trotsky's idea of teaching the young socialists how to shoot was a poor piece of marksmanship, he was investigated by the House Un-American Activities Committee and fired from his job as a TV game show host. Or went out for... Buddy Lewis. That... <laughs> In China, activists used puns to protest the Tiananmen Square massacre by smashing small bottles onto the ground, which only makes sense when you realize that the name of China's leader at the time, Deng Xiaoping, sounds a lot like the word for little bottle, or Xiaoping Zi. Even today, Chinese citizens are using puns to fight back against injustices and censorship. One of the biggest, loudest, and most public pun protests is the grass mud horse. 
The Grass Mud Horse looked like a silly kid song about a family of alpaca-like creatures that lived in peace until they were attacked by river crabs. But then, once they defeated the terrible river crabs, they could finally live in peace again. Now, this definitely sounds like just a weird little kid song, right? But, to quote an explanation of the song, its subversion lies in the fact that while the printed characters for Grass Mud Horse are benign, the spoken words sound like the Mandarin for fuck your mother. In the very popular YouTube hit, a children's chorus sings of the animal's virtues. At the same time, the lyrics are crude puns about a woman's anatomy, mother-son incest, and the way the Grass Mud Horses defeated invading river crabs and river crabs sounds like the Mandarin word for harmony, which is the government's favorite justification and euphemism for censorship. In other words, they created an entire kids song to get away with saying otherwise censored words while having plausible deniability and simultaneously protesting the so-called harmony imposed on them by the government. Clearly, puns are powerful. They allow us to tease rigid regimes and laugh in the face of seemingly inescapable injustices. If the outright activism of protest is speaking truth to power, then the subtler, more subversive activism of puns is telling jokes to power. Puns are a way to express frustration and knock the powerful down a few pegs without actually getting in trouble because the very nature of puns gives you plausible deniability. Puns can legitimately change the world. But not everything has to be so serious all the time, right? Because while puns can do all this amazing stuff like making big political statements against powerful regimes and highlighting the intricate complexities of the human brain, they don't have to. Because what puns excel at most is play. At their core, puns are about playfulness. They're about taking two disparate ideas and finding where they overlap and then taking advantage of that overlap to bring some whimsy into the world. And I think that that's why people don't like puns. Not only is it the pretentious classism that's a holdover from the Enlightenment days, but it's also because puns are childish. And when I say childish, I really do mean in the manner of children, but I don't mean it as a pejorative like most people do. To most people, kid stuff is stupid and meaningless and naive and not the realistic, serious stuff of the real world. But to me, childishness is playful curiosity. Childishness is about looking at the world like you're seeing everything for the first time. And when you see connections between things, it's about finding joy and beauty in it. Puns play a formative role in childhood development by revealing the relationship between words, sounds, context, and meaning. Knock-knock jokes and riddles that children learn on the playground usually turn on puns. For example, what has four wheels and flies? A garbage truck. As children gleefully learn to spot and evaluate secondary meanings in common words and phrases, they're really learning how to think critically. To get the joke, they have to overlook the obvious to explore other possible interpretations of what they've just heard. Though often dismissed as juvenile, riddles and knock-knock jokes actually require significant powers of abstraction, a complete subversion of rules, and a special appreciation for surprise. And, uh, can you not, like, bite me, please? Why don't you come sit on my... <clears throat> oh. Oh, bless you. <laughs> play, both physical play and word play, are how we figure things out. It's how we experiment and take risks. Play is at the core of the human experience, and puns at their core are playful. Why else would so many characters and catchphrases be puns? Seriously, think of any superhero and their name or their catchphrase is probably a pun. Or better yet, think of Pokemon, one of the most successful, most ubiquitous, and most well-loved series on the face of the earth, and every single one from your Bulbasaur to your Calyrex is a pun. Bulbasaur, 
objectively the best Gen 1 starter is a bulb and a dinosaur, and he's also a little bit bulbous. Uh, Pikachu gets its name from combining the Japanese onomatopoeias for the sound of a spark and the squeak of a mouse. Even the word Pokemon is a pun, a combination of pocket and monster. Pun-related wordplay is everywhere, and for good reason. Because it's fun. Because it's interesting. Because it's a way to bring charm and complexity and just a little bit of chaos into our lives. Inevitably, some people will never like punning because it fogs up the lens of clarity through which they view the world and impose order, or at least the illusion of order. But if puns seem at times to confuse, they actually enlighten us through both laughter and insight. They keep us from taking ourselves too seriously and sharpen our capacity for creative thinking. Ultimately, puns keep our minds alert, engaged, and nimble in this quickening world, revealing new connections and fresh interpretations. And that's why, even as we hurtle into a future of uncertain opportunities, puns will always be more than semantics. Who do you want, little boy? All of this is to say, puns are great, y'all. They're not the lowest form of humor, and they're not lazy, and can you not do that, please? And they're not stupid, and they're a vital part of the history of language. They do really cool stuff for our art and our brains and our societies, and on top of that, they're just fun. So, the next time that someone groans at a pun or you feel like you have to apologize for making one, remember that there is no shame in punning. You're simply following in the tradition of some of the best artists and writers and musicians and exercising your brain and bringing more joy into the world while you're at it. Because puns aren't bad. They're actually good. No, that's not the- it's good actually good I don't know how to do this, like, pretend like you messed up thing. What do you think, Charles? Any schmutz on your face? All right, let's do one more. Gentle reader, whosoever thou art, receive in good part what we have here written. Imbue thyself with such a love of punning and such a sense of its dignity that thy efforts may exult and not degrade it. So shalt thou merit the good wish, which with a sincere heart we now bestow upon thee. Mayest thou become one of the warmest admirers of punning, and shine as one of the first of punsters. Thank you uh, so much for watching to the end of the video. Um, I know that this one took a while, but I moved uh, and started working with the new editor and it was like a whole thing, so I hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you did, be sure to like and comment and subscribe, sub subscribe and do all those other YouTube things. Um, and if you've enjoyed the editing, be sure to leave some love in the comments for my wonderful friend, Charlie Flowers, not to be confused with Charlie the cat that is on my lap right now, um, without whom this video just wouldn't exist. Um, and of course, I want to also give a huge shout out to the incredibly talented Odd uh, for the art that she did for this video, and to the armchair Egyptologist, who supplied his wonderfully British voice to the voiceover quote near the beginning. Um, and if you'd like to help support me so I can continue to work with awesome folks like these and keep making videos full time, then come on over to Patreon, which is linked in the uh, description. This video also wouldn't have been possible without support from Sigwa, A Tasty Snack, Comrade Fox, Robert Bradford, Jameson Huddle, Dylan, Adam, Al Swigert, Matheson Bailey, and Science Punk Sellout. Thank you all so very much. Uh, and last but not least, we have our patron poem of the video. This one is for Seth Zard, which is a great name. Um, also works with the sort of Pokemon theme that happened at the end here. Uh, and this one is called Linguist's Pride. So let's get this. I'm not reading it off my phone. I don't know why I'm pretending that I am. Um, <laughs> Did you know that there are over a million words in the English language? 
which sounds like a lot until you remember only 17% of those million are in use. And a single person only knows about 15% of that 17%. And then we're at only 2.5% and suddenly we feel very small. Can you not scratch the couch, please? In an infinitely expanding universe, how could we even imagine finding a word? Not even a word, just a sound for all the things and the colors we'll never see, and the plants that will be born 10,000 years after the last great-granddaughter of the last earthbound human dies. And even knowing how insufficient our words are, knowing how short we come to speaking the names of all the things, knowing how the universe sees the hubris of linguists as the ambitions of a child who hasn't yet seen the stars, somehow there are still people who hate the word moist. And until next time, stay safe, stay warm, and I will see y'all again soon, I hope. Bye, folks. I look like a, uh, NSA agent. I'm snooping on ya girl. That's dumb. I don't know why I said that. Follow your heart and your dreams. Look, it's cocaine. Look, I have a face. Please focus on the face.